My question's for Jordan. Oh, uh, oh yeah, I know, All right, right? keep it short. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, this gets out of hand rapidly. As, uh, as a medical doctor, um, is there like a class at medical school that they teach that tells people not to lift? Because when I told my doctor, what I, when he asked, what do you do for fitness? And I said, uh, well, I'm on this, you know, kind of weightlifting, powerlifting program, squat, deadlift. He goes, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. I'm, I was 32. And he goes, you are way too old to be working out like that. I mean, is there, is there something Shit. they teach you guys? Um, no, so the formal training in exercise for physicians is nil. So that, that's true. That being said, we are exposed to... You're hearing his personal bias, in other words. Right. That's what I want. So, so yeah, the, the, uh, we are exposed to guidelines in, uh, as far as, oh, here are the current recommendations. So, for instance, 2010, the American College of Sports Medicine, despite all my disagreements with them at large, put out the first physical activity guidelines for adults, which includes twice-weekly resistance training with progressive overload. Uh, twice weekly vigorous cardiorespiratory activity, which would be high intensity interval training, or you could do four times per week of moderate intensity uh, cardiorespiratory training. Now, I don't love that, but it's certainly better than, oh yeah, just go walk, or just don't do anything and die, right? So it, it came to my attention during my medical training that this was not being recommended, and I just decided to figure out, one, how big is the problem, two, what can I do about it to improve it? So the problem, here's the size of the problem. All right. When you, we poll 50,000 primary care physicians, what percentage do you think of them are even aware of these recommendations? Uh, two. Three. Six percent of all these physicians are aware that these recommendations exist. Less than half of the people who know the recommendations exist actually recommend them to their patient. Okay. So, so three percent of primary care of physicians people. may recommend you do resistance training whatever the ACSM says that looks like, and some vigorous activity, okay? That's a huge problem, right? And so they cite things like, we don't have enough time, we've never done it ourselves, they don't feel comfortable discussing it with other patients because they're out of shape, either the patient or them. So there's a lot of transference and counter-transference going on. So, I, you know, in a 15-minute visit, if you come in, you need to refill or we need to discuss something else, at the end, you say, oh, yeah, yeah, and you should exercise more. But that doesn't even happen. Again, just less than 10% of the time that happens. So, uh, yeah, that was one of the big impetus uh, for starting Barbell Medicine as, a, you know, some, as providing educational resources. So right now on my website we have a pamphlet and a big document for physicians like, hey, here's what you should be doing, here's why, here's the evidence, this, that, and the other. And we're trying to push that. And, I mean, that's one of my biggest – That's if there's a reason why I'm here – besides to spend a lot of money on shoes and uh, use too many Z's in words, it's to uh, make more people who are in a position of power to influence your daily activity aware uh, that this stuff exists. Um, Rio? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mike. He'll send him an invoice. All right. <laughs> yeah, I just want to know if there's uh, any strategies to use to manage total fatigue in the event of a uh, an unexpected stressor, like car accident, loss of family, you hooked up with a random, now she's pregnant. You know. <laughs> now she's pregnant. <laughs> hooked up with a random, and now she's pregnant. And wrap that thing up. <laughs> well, I'm just, you know. It's after the fact. I'll get my All right. So anyway, uh, uh, yeah, there are strategies. There are initiatives. All right. So the way you do Godspeed. that is more carefully manage your day, well, all right? That gets a, to avoid unexpected stress. More carefully manage your day. If you're training, the training has to take priority. So you make plans. You fix things up so that insane shit like that doesn't happen to the greatest of your ability. You have a car wreck. You get yourself hurt. You're just going to have to deal with it. You have to make sure you're eating, make sure you're sleeping. Uh, but basically, uh, you may have figured this out. Life is sometimes not what we would call fair, what the college kids nowadays call fair. And this whole process of learning how to train and growing up is a just a pathway, learning how to wind through it with minimum amounts of distraction and 
liability. And it's a skill set. It's a skill set. Some people, good God, guy I graduated high school with, uh, was riding his bike out on, uh, out on Southwest Parkway a long time ago, about 20 years ago, he was riding his bike out on Southwest Parkway. Drunk driver pulled across five lanes of traffic and hit him on his bicycle, lost his arm, fucked up both of his legs, just destroyed him physically. He comes back from that. He has another car wreck. He gets all fucked up in that. Not his fault. And now about two months ago, he turns up with pancreatic cancer. This is a guy my age. Fuck. You know? And then, you know, some people just waltz through without any, without any trouble whatsoever. You know, it doesn't make any sense. But you just have to deal with it however you can. It's like the family feel good story of the Q and A. Yeah. Which was <laughs> which was that some people have really fucked up lives and you can't fix it. Right. The simple answer is you eat and you sleep and you train anyway. Yes. Yeah. We train. That's the you difference between training and exercise, right? So you get in a car accident. The training helps you manage the cortisol. Right. It helps you manage the stress. So well, I'm going to get my example for that. Correctional officer. Um, I was getting ready for nationals. I had deadlifts that day. Next thing I know, I have a hit put out in my life. How do I deal with that? I got to train anyway, but I'm still fucked up from the normal process of, oh shit, I almost got shanked. How do you continue to train on that day knowing that you had your life in jeopardy? You carry a gun. <laughs> no, okay. Well, get a better job. <laughs> yeah, I, I, hey, no shit. Get a better job, Rio. <laughs> That's not a good job, okay? I mean, Where is an occupational hazard, you have hits put out, get a better job. <laughs> That's how you manage that particular stress. Duh. Yeah. Well, I okay? mean, there's going to be a handful of things that are out of your control always, okay. right? I mean, yeah. my example is medical residency, you're 80 hours a week in the hospital, then you got to train on top of that, plus I'm driving around L.A. an yeah. hour each way. For, and there's nothing that I can do outside of making sure I'm trying to sleep as much as possible and making sure that I'm eating appropriately uh, that, you know, to maintain my weight at least, um, if, that, if that's what I was doing at the time, in order to make my training be somewhat productive. Um, as far as, uh, you know, specific adjustments that you can make, I think understanding what this job, what the, what the training stress is supposed to be that day and adjusting the parameters of your workout to meet that training stress. So for instance, if it's a deadlift day, a deadlift priority day, and you know it's supposed to be heavy, well, you're still gonna deadlift first, you're still gonna be heavy, the load, load, absolute load might be lighter, but that training stress is still similar. Does that make sense? Even if it's a little lighter because somebody wants to kill you. Dexter. Question about steak. Steak? Steak, like the food. <laughs> Favorite cut, or in your opinion, the best cut, how to prepare it yourself and why, and include method of cooking in any ancillary Hey, can I try to guess what your answer is, really, if I just fast answer? Yeah. Okay, you're going to say sirloin, because yeah. that's the most flavorful piece yeah. of meat, and that the tenderloin well, is think. the wives' cut. That's the wives' cut. <laughs> and that one of the best things about the meat is you dry age it longer than normal, yes. right? 28 to 40 days, something like that, Yes. right? Yes. And your preferred method is grilled open, over an open fire. No. No? No. It's not? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> two, two out of three ain't bad, no, as Meatloaf no, you're, would you're, say. You're close. All right. I've, I've been doing this beef thing for 10 years now, and I've taken apart, you know, many, many sides of beef from one end to the other. And the, in my opinion, the best beef on the side is the sirloin. It has the best flavor. Uh, like he said, the, the least flavorful is the tenderloin. There's nothing to it. It's delicious. He's it's crazy. <laughs> so, the, as far as the steak is concerned, a, a ribeye is not my favorite. Right? Uh, there are parts of the chuck that are very, very good in terms of flavor. In terms of beef flavor, it's hard to beat the cheek meat. The head meat, 
what we call uh, barbacoa down in Texas, where they where you you uh, cook the head and then scrape the cheek meat and all the face meat off of it. It's just got a lot of blood and a lot of myoglobin in it. It just it's just an intense beef flavor. It's got like like you added bouillon to it. Uh, but as far as the steak is concerned, I prefer a sirloin. Now, that having been said, a sirloin very seldom will grade above middle choice. It will sometimes go high choice, but I've never seen a prime sirloin. They sell them at Sam's all the time. I buy prime, prime sirloin sirloins. every week never, at Sam's. Never seen one. Delicious. <laughs> never seen one. You'll notice they did not have a sirloin on the menu at Pappas Brothers. They didn't. And all they, they serve didn't. is prime. And all they serve is prime. Uh, and if you ask them why, they'll say, because sirloin doesn't grade prime. Yeah. That's what they say. Good. You know, Sam's, though. Those guys know. Okay. What about the best way so, to cook the what? said steak? Have now, if I was going to cook a dry-aged steak, an expensive dry-aged steak, I want, to, I want to taste the beef. So I cook it on a hot cast iron pan. Oil? Butter. Butter. Hot cast iron pan, salt and pepper, and that's all. If I'm trying to examine the quality of the beef, that's how you do it. Medium, rare. Rare doesn't tell you anything. Medium's too long, so medium, rare. And uh, don't forget the chuck. All right, if you're going to buy side beef, uh, don't just assume that all of the stuff in the chuck is a roast. There are some stuff in, there's some stuff in the chuck, the Vegas Strip they're starting to sell now. It's an excellent piece of beef. And it'll grade higher than the, the loin will. Like you might get a, you might get a, what is for all intents and purposes, a prime Vegas Strip out of a carcass that graded middle choice. That happens all the time. Because, yeah, don't forget about the chuck. The chuck's good. A lot of times I'll just make tips out of the chuck. Cook them to medium rare. Just make tips out of them and, and saute them real fast and hot and butter and salt and pepper. That's an excellent way to use that. Yeah. I mean, We're on the, the third starting strength book. Um, the, the philosophy, the application of it seems pretty mature. Is there going to be a, a fourth book or is there going to be like a squat 2.0, anything like that? Or is No. No, we're... You know, at the, the refinement process looked like that curve, too. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're just kind of ornamenting the, the thing at this point. But no, there are no major revisions planned. You have some possible new books that could come out from other people in the starting strength community, but you personally are not I'm, planning on I'm writing done. anything. I'm done with anything the except articles. Okay. So in, in college football, you had the spread offense that started out with just a few schools running it, and then it quickly spread across the entire landscape of college football. Why do you think there hasn't been um, a strength program that was effective at a program that had a similar uh, reaction and was quickly adopted? This is going to be harsh. You ready? Because I don't think college-level strength and conditioning people are very intelligent. In the same way that I don't think high school football coaches are very intelligent, I don't think they're smart enough to understand something as simple and as straightforward as what we're telling you to do. I think they're terribly susceptible to fads. I think... A guy comes along that happens to be doing some exotic, weird, proprietary nonsense, but it happens to be working with the 55 freakiest freaks that year, and his team does well. I think these people attribute incorrectly uh, things to that particular strength and conditioning program that can't be attributed to it. It grows in popularity nonetheless. I think a lot of that's the internet's fault. I mean, you've got, when Boyd Epley started NSCA back in 19, late 1970s, 
there wasn't any such thing as YouTube. And there wasn't really any way to get distracted from his basic approach to barbell strength and conditioning. And now you can't help but get distracted. I mean, you've seen all the shit on the on YouTube about first one college, then another doing all this crazy shit in the weight room. It can't possibly get anybody strong. There's no systematic approach to it. There's merely a systematic approach to trying new exercises every workout. They have no idea of the stress, recovery, adaptation cycle. They don't even attempt to understand it. And to a certain extent, I don't think they're capable of understanding it because I don't think they're very intelligent. And I mean, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I was going to make sure you're, you're specifically I. asking how, why this hasn't taken off in well, collegiate or across the world in general. Yeah, using college as an example, it would seem somebody would get it right somewhere and that other oh, – so There for, are a few people that have well, gotten it yeah. Hold on, though. But then in would, collegiate sports or in gen population in general? Collegiate, collegiately. And then yeah. you would see others then imitate that success in the same nope. way – doesn't happen. Yeah. So my, some of my imitate. some of my best friends who are good guys are head division one strength coaches at major huge 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 universities. They don't get it. They don't get it. It's it's who you know, not what you know. And Sacramento State's the only college your, we actually your hands know of. your hands are tied by We're, the football coaches who are the most arrogant human beings you'll ever meet in your life, and they've decided that my kids need to do this because I read read it in a magazine or because my other buddy who's also a coach had their kids do this and it's the way this works it's too simple man so the thing is is you're paying these guys these these head strength the head strength coaches at d1 universities making 200 grand a year which is pretty good money until you figure out that they're all working 130 hours a week which is then pretty shitty per hour sort of rate right how hard is it to just say hey here's what we're going to do workout a squat three sets of five press deadlift Next day, squat, bench press, power clean. And even though it's going to work better than everything else, that kind of makes it seem like you're not worth the $200,000. So just in the same problem that the, the – Complexity sale. Right. In the business world where your physical – where your personal trainers have to give you a constantly changing program that you can't ever figure out because you've got to keep paying me so I can keep feeding you this complicated program. So that's why, that's why when somebody calls me a personal trainer or joining a personal trainer, I take offense to it. Because I'm not a personal trainer, I'm a coach. Because the program is easy. I'm a, I, I work on your, I make your movement correct, right? You go back to Friday night's lecture, what Nikki talked about. I get you to move the way I want you to move. That's not what it's about at Division One. It's, it's politics, it's agility. I, I went to Baylor, my guy was not at Baylor anymore, so Baylor's big school football. And their strength and conditioning program was 47 dynamic movements as their warm-up before they actually worked out. 47 different movements. You know how much they were coached? They all lined up on a line, tweet, they blow the whistle, they fire off, right? And they let them do it. And if somebody didn't, if a coach didn't like the way they did it, they, they blow their whistle again. And they say, you stupid motherfucker, you don't deserve to wear that shirt that says Baylor on it, turn it inside out, get back on the line and do it right. There's no now that's coaching. There's no coaching, <laughs> right? Football coaches do this all the time. I was a football coach for 10 years, right? Guy runs out for a pass, turns, tries to catch the ball, misses. Coach says what? Catch the goddamn ball. That's not coaching. Why did he miss the – don't you think he was trying to catch the ball? It's not coaching. All right, so this is who you're dealing with, and because this is who you're dealing with, this is why this is never going to take off with these people. And guys at USC and guys at Alabama and guys at Auburn – can do any program they want to do, and they're going to go out and win 12 games a year because they're the right, best they're athletes genetic, on the planet. They're hiding behind. Doesn't the, matter what so they the do. So the short answer is the strength and conditioning coaches get to hide behind the genetics, and the head coach is not intelligent enough to understand that's what the strength and conditioning coach is doing. 